The following video documents the experiment in which my friend Adrian Bouillon and I carried out to discover both the polar patterns of the college's own Cyclops sub bass speakers and the effects of pointing one of three bass speaker cabinets in the opposite direction of the audience. Although counterintuitive, there are proven benefits of this which we hope will become apparent in this video, but summaratively it goes like this. The cardioid subarray is very useful in high powered situations to direct the sound of the speakers to their desired area while eliminating it in unwanted areas. Bass tends to travel omnidirectionally, and this omnidirectional bass gets everywhere, onto the stage, interfering with the performers and what they can hear out of their monitors, and even to residential areas behind outdoor live shows, causing much disruption to homes and places of work. This can often result in complaints and even just shows being shut down, not to mention that it's not ethical to annoy people who aren't attending the gig. Although the speaker cabinet in the middle of the three is facing backwards, its job is actually to suppress the noise behind rather than to enforce it. To do this, the correct delay must be applied to the speaker in order for its waves to cancel out the waves from the other speakers, much like we see when two perfectly out-of-phase signals, which are panned left and right, are both brought into the middle of a stereo mix and cancel themselves out and disappear away to nothing. Using the correct delay, we can drastically reduce the noise behind the speaker cabinets. This method tends to work to a particular frequency, so we've done it across three useful sub bass frequencies that we can then reference in the future as and when we need to. We've chosen 40 hertz, 50 hertz and 60 hertz as the frequencies which we're going to find the ideal delays to decrease the sound at the back as much as possible. To do this indoors would not work. The reflections present in even the largest of spaces would interfere with the readings and so this experiment should ideally be carried out in an anechoic chamber. As an anechoic chamber is hard to come across, the next best thing is to do outside. This means we can take measurements free from reflectional interference. The first part of this video shows us setting up and implementing the experiment. We took our measurements at intervals of 30 degrees from front to back throughout 180 degrees. And since the polarity is symmetrical, it is perfectly okay to just mirror our results for the other side, as long as our 180 degree axis is the same as the axis of projection. This allows us to become the first proud owners of the polar patterns of these Cyclops cabinets which were manufactured in Perth College UHI, adhering to plans downloaded from the internet. My sincerest apologies for leaving the camera on autofocus while videoing. Okay, we're just about to start our live experiment, our cardioid base experiment. We've got the fire door deactivated, we're about to run the cables out of there and we're going to set up here in the field. We've decided to face the rear projection to, towards the car park and we're going to be aiming the whole system towards the mountains over there or the hills over there and making our measurements on this bit of grass here. Yeah, because what we want is to keep uh, habitations quiet so we don't want to get our stack facing there to like prevent from any noise disturbance so we choose uh, our zero and 180 degrees axis to be on two uh, no habitations areas. Perfect. So minimum sound towards the college and the house is over there. So that's us currently set up with our three cyclopses and they're powered off the CSC the QSC, sorry. And uh, we've got all the speakers at the same level. We've got a high pass filter on them, rolling off at 24 dB per octave. And uh, they're all coming off the same input. If we go to the back here, we have the speak ons, and they go top, middle, bottom. We've got our reference microphone down here, measured, uh, and uh, it's been calibrated. Oop, the base. It's been calibrated in Smart Live. We've got our calibrator here, and we've got Smart Live running on the laptop. Our reference microphone comes into the computer here via the interface, and our signal's been generated by Smart Live. 
and it's coming to the desk here. We've checked it on uh, what all the individual speakers and they're all working, but now we're going to use the three together. And we've also got an aux send of the signal back into the computer to compare with. So we've got uh, the visual representation of what it should be and then what it is over here so we can compare the two for easy distinguishability. We've also taken measurements of uh, one single speaker to distinguish the polar pattern and then we can compare the polar pattern of the three combined and that will again help us to see how much of a difference we've actually made. There's currently a 60B drop off at the back so our aim is to try and achieve a, a better drop off at the back so uh, we'll see how much we can get it down from 6 decibels. That's the sound pressure level I'm referring to there. And just to show you our Excel document where we are making notes of all our readings as we go. More of that later. We've got a little bit of uh, ambient noise interference over there but I don't think we'll have any problem with uh, 40, 60 and 80 hertz. And we've got a wind blocker on the microphone as well to just try and cut down the wind noise. So we've now got the three going together and we've tested it at the front and the back. And there's only a one decibel difference and that's with no delays applied. So with no delays it's actually worse. So we'll report back when we've figured out the correct delay. Uh, delay we've now found the sweet spot. Musical. We've delayed it by 22 milliseconds and uh, that's given us an amazing result. We've got uh, the front at 90 dB and the rear at 72. So that's a decrease of 18 decibels. So basically it's gone half the volume and then half the volume again, and then half the volume again at the back. So, so uh, much better than when we had no delay. 22 milliseconds seems to be the sweet spot, and what we're going to do now is test at 40, 60, and 80 hertz, because that was at 30 we just tested. So at 60, we achieved the 24 roll off with a 13 milliseconds delay on the back speaker. Fucking right. As you can see, I swear. it's working at pretty high levels. We are 110 dB SPL at front and 86 at the back. Once the best delay for these speakers had been identified, we then checked the other two frequencies at this delay just to see what it gave us. At the bottom left here, we see that on a single sub on its own, there's already a 6 dB roll-off at the back. So although it's less than at the front, we, we aimed and were able to drastically improve this. The results for each test show that in most cases, by experimenting with the delays, we managed to get near a 20 decibel roll-off at the back and at 13 milliseconds we can clearly see a 24 dB roll-off for 60 Hz. The following pictures illustrate the polar patterns for the three test frequencies at every delay. Each one of the pictures used represents the ideal delay for one of the three frequencies. The bigger the dip at the back, the bigger the reduction in volume. Layering the three patterns on top of each other in different colours like this allows us to see how the polar patterns of the other frequencies deviate from their cardioid shape as we move away from their target delay, and we can clearly see which delays are useful to us to achieve the results we as engineers are after, and I think the results are quite interesting.